either uh, be disadvantaged or be it uh, a citizen, be it the community around. So there are so many components of stakeholders who will uh, necessarily be uh, beneficiaries every time you have a corporation that actually practices good, good citizenship. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Dr. Wadanga, uh, one of the challenges that we possibly have, and it has been said, and I'd like to hear your comments on that, is that the issue we have with our governance, be it corporate, be it government, is that it has a very uh, huge uh, fulcrum on selfishness. And what I mean by this is that it looks like most people who get into governance are there for resource management, which ends up being in a you know, sort of selfish manner. But from what you're describing is that governance really is meant to be there for the better of the larger stakeholders. And that would be either the citizenry or those, if it's a company, those who benefit from that particular company. Where do we get it wrong? I think that's, that's, that's a very uh, important question. And in fact, it's one of the uh, issues that we want to uh, tackle in this uh, governance uh, summit. As a matter of fact, we are expecting uh, many uh, county governors um, uh, from uh, hopefully uh, most, if not all, the, uh, the counties in this country. Because one of the issues we want to look at is that of uh, public participation. The reason I want to m uh, mention public participation is that uh, in this country, we have uh, kind of uh, decided or thought that uh, uh, development is uh, doing things for people, and it is about projects, it's about uh, tenders, it's about uh, procurement. And so people who go into uh, positions of leadership are thinking about development in terms of what projects can be done, can be done what uh, tenders can I get, what procurement can I be involved in. And that's the reason why public participation is important because development is not doing things for people, it is not uh, obviously benefiting from uh, what uh, people should benefit from. It is tapping into people's aspirations and resources. And uh, aspirations because, uh, first of all, we should find out from people, hey, what, what needs do you have? Mm -hmm. So that you're not doing things that uh, you have decided in a boardroom, you're doing the things that, uh, but because we have ulterior motives in terms of uh, uh, procurements and uh, tenders and so on. That's the reason why we, r we rush into, in, in, into, into projects. And so one of the things um, we want to, to, to look at uh, in the Governor's Summit is if public participation is that important for determining what is best for the community, why is it not working uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in this country? What is it that we need to do to make it uh, work better? and the evidence that it is not working. And I should know because in my day job, I work with the county governments, uh, supporting them in uh, developing policies and, uh, and plans. And where, when it is time to do uh, public participation, it is a uh, you know, tick the box kind of exercise. Mm. And we see it in the newspapers when uh, a government or a county government um, uh, announces that there's going to be public participation in three days time. If you really want people to participate in making decisions about their development, you want to give uh, ample time. Ample time. Uh, uh, but plan. people, you know, say, mm. if I knew that there was going to be a public participation uh, forum, I would actually take time to go because I know it is very, very important for for our community. The other reason why, the other evidence that it is not working, is that if public participation is so important. Why is it that we, who are meant to be beneficiaries, want to be paid to, to participate, participate. In, uh, in, in those fora? And, and that is happening all, okay. all, all over the country. Uh, let me come to your barre. And mm -hmm. public participation is something that um, Dr. Wadanga says is not working. And maybe many Kenyans would probably agree. But part of the reason, apart from the fact that maybe it is intentionally or for whatever reason, even the announcements are made very late, but there could be an element of lack of understanding and civil education, whereby if I see that advert, and this goes back to what we're talking about, governance being put in a boardroom by an elite group that sit there and do things that we do not understand. But as a citizen, help me understand, first of all, how do I participate? And secondly, uh, educate me or, or educate us on uh, why it is important and how to actually participate and have what my needs are 
represented right there? Um, the civic, civic education part of it. I think it's one of the things that actually that we need to really uh, continue moving forward to in terms of uh, educating people. So they begin appreciating that their interests are represented at, uh, at the high level. We talk about any organization that is running has to be run by a governing body. So it's good for a citizen to think, how am I represented in the governing body? And how do I have accountability to the person who represents me for them to be able to uh, represent my interest? And i give you an example. As an institute, we run what we call the champion of governance for the last 10 years. One thing we have seen is that so many people now, they're actually getting more interested in seeing the people who are the board, how are they answerable back to the people who are supposed to have some bit of interest. We took an example sometime of a county whereby how a county is developed. Uh, a county like Makueni, for, exa for example, we realized that because they have been able to actually mobilize the people to ensure that the, the people, the, the vision of that uh, county is represented, they have been able to develop more so that the, 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 the actions, there is actually a mechanism whereby you give your views to the people on the top so that people who govern you are able to have your input there. And that way, you get a lot of cooperation from the people who are citizenry. So it's actually upon us as the citizen to be able to start asking hard questions, to have people uh, uh, be accountable and have a way of uh, 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 feedback, how they, they communicate to them and how we get feedback from those particular people. All right. Yeah. Check, One, two, sound check, one, two, sound check, one, two. Uh, is my mic okay? Okay, uh, Obare, just uh, count one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is he's okay. Um, sound check, Beatrice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, and finally, Dr. Wadanga. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I think we're good. So when we... Okay, so... Is there a break in between now and then? <coughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay, I need to stand by. Then, uh, communicate. please keep your knees down. Yeah. Sound check, one, two, three, four. Sound check, one, two, three, four. 
one, two, three, four. Right, and uh, well, we do apologize that we took a rather sudden break there, but there was a technical issue which has now been sorted out. It's now 23 minutes after 8. In case you're joining us now, well, we're talking about governance, and there's a summit that's coming up that we are going to be focusing on as well, but mainly it focuses on governance. Now, before we took the break, uh, we were looking at uh, civil education and why it is important for Kenyans to understand, and I'll come to you, Beatrice, why it is important for Kenyans, one, to understand public participation, and secondly, how to participate. Um, thank you again. It is very important to participate. In fact, I'll start with the, with the public. It is very important to participate in these forums. When you hear an advert that um, a public forum is being called, it is important that you be part to, part to it so that you also determine the way you are going to be governed or what project is going to be planted in your county, or how your life is going to be affected. So the onus is also on the citizenry. You need to participate in these forums so that you don't come back later and find uh, the project has moved ahead and uh, you start coming back to, to, to destroy it or to, to pull it back. These are investors will have committed money uh, and that is just one aspect. Uh, it goes ahead uh, even in, uh, in the areas of uh, election of, uh, of, uh, of our leaders. It is important that you participate, you understand who they are. If Beatrice is coming forward for asking you for a vote or for a leadership support to get a leadership position, find out who Beatrice is, what are her credentials, what, what does she stand for. So public participation, I must say, is very important. It should be well coordinated. Should, we should not take people by surprise or target uh, to, 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 avoid the, to avoid the public. Like, for example, putting very short deadlines. Uh, you are in Western Kenya and a meeting, uh, the forum is called in Nairobi the following morning so that you, you don't attend. We need to give... Um, uh, enough time so that everybody is able to consolidate uh, ideas and even just consult uh, on what they will, or even for them to have effective participation in the, mm -hmm. in the forum. So when there is part uh, participation, you get less problems moving ahead. You carry everybody along. You don't get somebody coming from behind to say, I didn't know this was going on. And in the end, you get good results, you get uh, good governance, you have involved all your, your stakeholders, people are able to think and conceive and, and uh, even make decisions on uh, what, how to participate in the project, how it will impact on them. And uh, you, will, you will remove uh, uh, people come with ideas when something is just done without their involvement, they think, you are hiding something. They fight it. Yes, mm -hmm. they fight it and they bring it down. All right. So public participation is very, very crucial. All right, Dr. Wadanga, listening to uh, and, and knowing that uh, things rise and fall on you know, leadership, it is important, like you've brought in the issue of uh, elections and we've just come from an election, and it is important the leaders that we have in place for us to have good governance. And from what I'm hearing from you, it requires a leader who has a heart, a heart for the people and a heart for the stakeholders. How do we establish and ensure that we have good leaders? Because without those good leaders, then governance becomes a challenge. Sometimes it sounds, feels like it's a deliberate effort uh, to ensure that there's no good governance for their own benefit. 
Absolutely. And um, uh, values um, are very important when it comes to uh, leadership and, uh, and governance. And, uh, and that is one of the things that uh, we, we always need to reflect on, that it is, uh, it is possible to have good principles of governance. It's good to have you know, the theory of what works. But at the end of the day, we need uh, individuals who, uh, who, value are, driven. Uh, who are value-driven, and they are committed to really serving um, the community and the country or the members of, of, of that organization. So leadership um, is, is, about, is about values, it's about uh, influence. And asking yourself, uh, where am I leading the people who are, who are following me? And so I think that is, and that's the reason why um, um, the, um, the, our constitution, uh, our new constitution has got you know, a, a chapter very, very strongly on, on values, leadership values. And I think that is something that we need to address uh, a lot more than just uh, the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. We are also talking about the, the spirit of the law. What are the values behind the people that we are putting into leadership? Mm -hmm. And those who are in leadership uh, asking themselves, um, is this about me or is it about uh, the people I'm leading? All right, Obare, when we look at our country, we certainly have challenges when it comes to our value system. And this is not just at a leadership level. Uh, if we just look at generally how we run our affairs, they're very, uh, it's like we're going farther and farther away from our values. And many of us have our values from different areas, some from culture, others from religion, others from, uh, you know, the way we've been brought up and all that. Are we moving away from a generation where we are value-driven to a point where we are material-driven? It becomes a big challenge, actually, because you realize that uh, you take a simple examples, for example, you ask, why would a successful person in a private sector go to a public sector and fail? to run an organization. So every time we talk about governance, we talk about governance as ethical governance, mm -hmm. and it's something from the heart. So we need to really begin going down into looking at ourselves and, uh, and weighing at ourselves and seeing what honesty do we have? Mm -hmm. How do we begin uh, inculcating these things from even our family level? You find that you've, uh, even within the families, people uh, do things within their homes not knowing the impact they have. Mm -hmm. We don't uh, seem to correct people we are losing a lot of co community uh, linkages. Our sort of uh, advisors and heroes have uh, questionable uh, integral issues. So you find that the value system within the country needs to be relooked, and people need to put these things really deep in their heart. So that every time I sit at ICPSK and run it, I run it from my heart and not for my own benefit. So it's a big mind shift that we need to really discuss and be honest about. Is, is that something that needs to be achieved from our education system? Is it how we run our homes? Where do we get that value system? Because day by day, it looks like we're going further away from it. It, it can't be from schools or education. Mm -hmm. It really has to be a mind, a software thing, I would say. Something that actually you feel a self-conviction. You must believe in some of these things. Nobody will educate you about them. So when you talk about being a leader, it means that you have to have some conviction in your heart and uh, not necessarily pride, because we've come from a regime where you realize everybody goes to the helm of an organization, and the first thing you look at is what is there for me. Mm. So we've, my we, we've, we've moved away from looking at everybody as a, as a whole. So we're talking about how do you involve every stakeholder? So we, I'm making a decision as a leader, I'm making a decision that is what we call the common good, mm. and not for my own benefit. All right, Beatrice, how do we regain our values? Because at the end of the day, you can be educated, you can have the best curriculum vitae, the resume is in place, and you probably look like somebody who can execute. But if your value system is wrong, then we end up with issues of governance. Michael, it is a big issue. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do as parents, as leaders, the society, church leaders. Everybody should get involved so that we can uh, uh, get our values back. We should start inculcating the values to our young children in school. We should call upon the teachers, call upon the parents, call upon the religious leaders, call upon uh, the corporate leaders, and everybody. Uh, this can be achieved more when we have uh, corporate governance in the organizations. And we have said organizations, whether private or public, whether small or big, including Michael, the family. The family is actually uh, 
like a corporate, and you need corporate governance in your own family. Mm -hmm. It starts there, because if you start uh, spending family money when the rest of the family members don't know, uh, or you are doing funny things where, when behind their backs, that is lack of uh, corporate governance. Mm -hmm. So we should start this in, uh, I, I, these skills, we should instill them in our young children, in our youths, so that they don't have this mindset of, oh, I must be rich. I must be rich in my first two years at work. We need a lot of, of, of work to do, and this calls for everybody. To everybody to be involved. All right, uh, Dr. let me come to you and let's talk about the summit and how, first of all, you intend to infuse some of these principles and tenants that we're talking about in those who would attend the summit. Yes, we have uh, a wonderful uh, menu uh, of, um, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the program that we have uh, put out, uh, out there. And uh, it will focus on, uh, on every, every institution. We will have uh, people from the corporate uh, sector, uh, from uh, listed companies, uh, from uh, SMEs. We will have uh, universities uh, uh, represented because we, we want to link not only uh, the way governance is uh, being practiced, but also how uh, governance is being taught, how it's being researched, and to ensure that what is uh, being researched is, uh, is, is applicable in a situation. You, you, know, you go to, to some of you know, research you know, projects and you find that what is being studied has no relevance with the, with the pains that are the happening there. You know, for example, in this country, there are so many uh, SMEs. We look at our economy and uh, uh, you find that uh, there's you know, small you know, family-owned uh, businesses and, uh, you know, and uh, SMEs and... Uh, uh, they contribute a lot to the economy, but when you look at uh, uh, corporate governance and literature, you you don't find uh, anything there. So that speaks so to them. So, so like retailers who are you know family businesses, when they want to learn, you know what? How can we better do this? There is nowhere to turn because we are not studying those things. So, um, and the other the, the other part of the menu, uh, we will be uh, actually talking about. Uh, you know, governance, particularly at county level, talking mm -hmm. about public uh, participation, um, talking about you know what what is it and uh, what I you know why is it not working for us, mm -hmm. and we are very pleased that uh, we will have uh, many county governments uh, represented by their governors and uh, deputy governors, and we are really looking forward to uh, to that. So we would really welcome uh, as many people who would like to uh, contribute to the development of uh, uh, corporate governance and governance in a, in a public sector uh, to come and, uh, and be part of, of, of this summit. All right, uh, Beatrice, what would you say has been the corporate governance journey of the country? If we look at it uh, you know, in retrospect and hopefully we'll project and see where we are headed, what would you say has been our journey? Uh, we've come a long way as a country and we must say we are somewhere. We have uh, professional institutions like the Institute of Public Certified Secretary, where we are members. We have Hesabika here. Uh, though these are institutions which are just focused on shaping governance in the country. We have um, our regulators. We have, uh, for example, Capital Markets Authority, uh, Nairobi Securities Exchange. We have other regulators like uh, SASRA in the SACO sector and uh, RBA in the retirement benefits sector, these have all come up uh, to shape governance in the institutions under their umbrella. So I must say we've come a long way. Uh, almost everybody is being uh, watched. We have the governance audits, uh, which are now compulsory according to the Mongozo um, uh, Code of conduct for public entities. Uh, in fact, Mwongozo itself is a big step forward. This is a, a blueprint, a document which was launched by none other than His Excellency the President, and it governs the contact of company, uh, companies which are uh, uh, government-owned, state-owned entities. Now, even the private-owned entities are also, the, there is a 
a code of governance which was developed by the Institute for Certified Public Secretaries. So all these in a journey to, towards good governance in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, the CEO talked about uh, Champions of Governance Award. This is an award where uh, corporates come and compete, uh, do the catwalk, and they are evaluated mm -hmm. under a tool which is very stringent just to get who is the best in governance mm. in the country. And uh, really this is a, a way forward. Granted, we have a lot to do. There is still a lot, a lot to do. There are some uh, sectors which are not very good. There is still a lot of work uh, yeah, to, be done. Needs to be done. Oh, yes. But what are, what are the gaps that we can identify uh, on our journey? And I'll come to you, sir. Uh, but what are some of the gaps that we can identify on this journey, you know, in terms of corporate governance? I think briefly what I would say is that uh, we have uh, focused so much on um, uh, the so-called, you know, the, the companies, listed companies, re regulated companies like, uh, like uh, the banks and all these institutions. But I think we need to now look at the other gaps like Kenya, which runs on so much on SMEs mm. and family businesses, which actually grow uh, in terms of the economics, but they don't grow in terms of governance. Mm. And therefore, you find they reach some level, and then you find a lot of challenges. And you've yeah, seen that in, in, in Kenya. It feels really that it's a big challenge. So the gap is we need to think how we can we really feel uh, our, 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 our education or our focus on this other sector which I feel has really been uh, neglected for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So that they also voluntarily begin growing both e economically in terms of the profits, also growing in terms of governance. All right, uh, Dr. Vanga, you wanted to weigh in on that? Yes, I wanted to mention that one of the uh, things that you're going to reflect on in this, in this summit is um, lo looking at uh, the governance codes that uh, we, we have in, the, in this country, whether we are looking at uh, the uh, the State uh, Corporations Advisory uh, Committee's CAC, uh, Morgozo Code, mm -hmm. or you're looking at uh, the governance codes for, say, listed companies. We have borrowed a lot from other jurisdictions, from other good practices of governance uh, in, other, in other countries, and particularly uh, when it comes to the King reports. So you find that the Morgozo Code uh, uh, particularly uh, borrows from King Three report, and uh, and the reason I'm mentioning that is that uh, King Three uh, uh, report has been, as it was, superseded by King Four, mm -hmm. uh, which was launched uh, in April uh, last year, uh, in 20, 2017. Now, uh, the the chair of the King com uh, report committee is a Professor Mervin King. Mervin King. And he is going to be the featured speaker uh, for, this, for this summit. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we are going to do in this summit is to look at uh, the King 4 code, which uh, is, is now in operation. And uh, because our codes uh, here in this country uh, have borrowed a lot from uh, King 3, we want to find out um, what, what are the new things in uh, King 4. What are some of the lessons that we can learn uh, in this country as we continue developing our governance uh, principles and, uh, and codes mm -hmm. uh, from uh, King Four and from uh, Professor Mervyn King himself. So mm -hmm. I think an opportunity even to interact with uh, uh, the King himself, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, think, mm -hmm. I think should be, should be a great opportunity. Uh, should be a very a good opportunity for, for, for everyone. Okay, and uh, maybe as we are almost winding up, just to understand fully, and uh, maybe I'll get that from CEO Obare, uh, the main objective, take home, what is it that you expect to achieve after the summit? Uh, the, the key one is actually to try and influence um, the market. And we are saying we have a new code. The, the question is, how do we now begin being the pioneers? We want to say, most of us sometimes are, are, we react to things. We want to be proactive and say, we have this new standard. We have this new uh, King 4 code. Uh, King for and how do we and begin? Maybe for the benefit of those who may not know what the codes are, maybe you could just briefly tell us what okay. the King Four code is. Yeah, uh, the King Four code uh, basically is that uh, um, uh, the Institute of Directors in South Africa normally will develop uh, codes mm. that will become like a benchmark, and they have done King One, King Two, King Three. Now we are in King Four. More like a best practice. Best practice, right? And therefore, you find that Kenya has really borrowed a lot from uh, King, King, uh, the King's reports. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So I'm having King chairs that particular committee okay. that has developed this, uh, these codes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are saying as a country, how do we begin embracing this particular code? 
and you know is a very robust code they talk about the code can be summarized to mean transparency mm -hmm. that's what basically talks about so you find that this really pushing towards disclosures is trying to involve stakeholders is talking about uh, assuming everybody applies these particular codes and therefore you even explain how you apply them so it's a really a robust kind of a code and therefore the king himself is supposed to talk about it and that's why we are saying once we want to become pioneers also in that uh, as an institution also that uh, develops codes mm -hmm. we want to borrow from that particular institution try to link up with the research one of the things we have done actually is that we are trying to model three companies and therefore we are putting on board companies to go through this particular code and we see at the end of the day how will they have improved or uh, become better because you find that we, we lack very many local study case studies so you find that if an institution goes down in kenya nobody takes time to probably go into this and say what, or what are the, or what has messed this particular institution mm -hmm. but you'll find people normally giving blanket statements around what fails where mm -hmm. so we want to begin now being particular about what has failed is it the diversity of the board is it the appointments is it the people the experience in that particular board that we we actually go deeper into looking into things and bring this what they're calling ethical governance uh, as opposed to saying you know you've complied to something in terms of ticks mm -hmm. that's actually where we are trying to move towards, and towards. That's the, yes all right and uh, Beatrice are there quantifiable benchmarks that one can use and say this is what we achieved from the summit yes when we have um, we have had the summit and it is over we expect change in uh, our governance structures in corporations as we we expect more than 500 participants to come to the summit so all these people will carry away uh, something we expect to see change we expect that next time when we go uh, as the as the institute for company secretaries when we go and do our champions of governance award we will have for example more people coming out to say i'm i'm ready to be to be examined you know that that one alone i'm ready to be assessed that is a bold statement mm. uh, people hide away and they don't want to be assessed so we expect many people to come uh, forward and after that we expect that we will really ha will see in their corporate governance barometer that they have moved out mm. so we are really looking forward to good things for this country after the summit um, borrowing from the king four report for example it is now all inclusive we are not for example focusing on state-owned entities it is going to include smes is it is going to include ngos it is going to include even retirement benefit funds and of course uh, uh, county governments as uh, our friend has alluded to and uh, we really expect the standards of governance and decision making and processes in this country mm -hmm. to go a notch higher. All right, Dr. Wadanga, uh, inclusive of your closing comments, who is invited? Is it open to the public? Uh, who is expected there? Well, we expect uh, uh, everyone who would be interested in uh, contributing to better governance of our country and of our institutions. So. Anybody who would like to come, we uh, encourage them to, to register. There will be uh, many people coming from, uh, uh, like we've mentioned, you know, listed companies, uh, from SMEs, from uh, NGOs, uh, from government, uh, you know, county government, and, uh, and uh, national government. So uh, anybody and everybody is, uh, is, is it welcome. Free? It is not free. Uh, <laughs> there, 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 is a, uh, there is a charge, you know, it's an expensive uh, um, uh, conf uh, conference mm -hmm. summit to, to put together. So there is uh, a lot of information about it in our website, mm -hmm. uh, governancesummit.co.ke, uh, mm -hmm. and we would encourage uh, people to, to look up at the details and register. Uh, the summit, uh, it's on Monday and Tuesday, so in fact uh, the, the closing date for registration is uh, a close of our business uh, today and okay. we would encourage so <laughs> as many people to, uh, mm. to come right. uh, so that they can have a contribution mm. in how we can make this country and our institution better governed. All right, your closing comments, Obare. Uh, I think governance is really something from the heart and we w I want to appeal to everybody that once you, know, you are in a position of leadership, you must look at the common good mm. and say, how do I drive this particular organization that I'm, uh, I'm interested to lead? 
which is a privilege, into the future, and it has to be from my heart for the common good, and who are the stakeholders that I'm supposed to carry along, and therefore how are the interests of all these stakeholders uh, taken care of when I'm running this particular institution. <coughs> that way you'll find out of success. Uh, for example, the country you find has challenges because we don't seem to push the common vision or common goal. Mm -hmm. Same to the institution, to the family and everything. So it has to come from the heart. We need to believe in these principles. We need to believe in these governance and so more uh, ethical governance. And that way we'll move forward as a, an institution, as a country. All right, Beatrice, your closing comments? Um, I would say these roles, leadership roles, uh, whether I'm steering an organization or whatever leadership role I'm interested in or an office, uh, I was not born with it. People have entrusted me and given me the mandate. So it's really key that I embrace corporate governance. So I call upon everybody to embrace good governance in all our positions in every small way and in every big way and do this by coming to the conference to hear about the, the bolts and nuts mm -hmm. of corporate governance. All right, thank, thank you. you very much, lady and gentlemen. That's Beatrice Meso, who's the vice chair of ICPSK. We also have Obare Nyaega, who's the CEO for ICPSK. And last but not least, Dr. Joshua Wadanga, who's the chair for Hesabika. And that is uh, where we wrap up Morning Express this morning and uh, this week, actually. And want to thank you all for uh, watching and keeping us company. And, uh, well, we take this opportunity to wish you a great day and a wonderful weekend. Do stay with us right here on KTN News as we have more news and reviews coming up on News Center. But do have yourselves a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. God bless. Oh. <laughs> Come on, it's, oh my god. It's, 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 is that a belt? Yes, it's a corset belt. Yeah. A corset belt that looks really, really good. Yeah. <laughs>
What are you saying? Iki tu ina umtu na posta aje. Asa umtu na posta aje iki tu. Haya imenda. Do you know India? Mkse ma you are na do you ana apa? Imagine you are mkse ma. Na ibrash. Ibrash ina ina kaje. Mungu wa tusaidi ya aki. Chato. Ati bam. Kwa ni mini. Chato. Bam, 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 bam. Siti kwa sato. Ae, siti lazima. Ichaja nita sahau. Ocha ni bebe. Ocha ni bebe. Eee. Hii ukiwana watu wanabeba hii, hawa ni wale watu wamepoteza charge original. Ha? Ok, let's do this. Asa si watu watasema mini ODM. Jua itai. Do I care? <laughs> hey, and here goes my Vaseline. Yibo. Yibo, yibo. Poor sana. Eh, hey, low mambo DM, mambo DM. No, no, orange, orange. Ah, last one to Jenge Baba. Mm hmm. Did you find the maneno? Sawa. Yo, iPad ni aje. Ah, finally. How are you? Uko freshy. Mazuri? Mazuri ya Friday. Ni Friday. Dumps, wanna put easy mics. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. I'm gonna put easy mics. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I'm better. One two one two one two one two one two one two one two. 
One, two, one, two, one, two, check mic. One, two, 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 one, two. Adi? Go sir. Check. One, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, 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 Nembe. One, two, one, two, mic testing. One, two, two, one. Hmm. But any South Yangu be kushtu, ha? The Director of Immigration, Gordon Kihalango, is by close of business today expected to swear and file affidavits explaining circumstances under which Miguna Miguna was deported to Canada on Tuesday night. The order was made by High Court Judge Luca Kimaru, who also wants Kihalango to explain how and when he took custody of Miguna Miguna from the police. Justice Kimaru also ordered the IG and DCI boss to swear affidavits and appear in court in person on February 14th to show cause why they should not be punished for disobeying the court. Of course, I'm going to link up with one of the Miguna Miguna's lawyers, Nelson Harvey, shortly. If you're just joining us, this is the News Center right here on KTN News. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim. Of course, it is Friday, the 9th day of February 2018, and definitely we have a lot lined up for you in the program. So let's take a look at some other big stories we are following for you this morning. And four more cabinet nominees will be vetted today by the Parliamentary Committee on Appointments. Only Jubilee MPs are sitting in the committee after their NASA counterparts stayed away, saying they do not recognize Uhuru Kinata as president. Elsewhere, Machako's governor, Alfred Mutua, will this morning know his fate when High Court Judge Agre Muchalule rules on a petition by Wavinia and Deti. Deti moved to court in September last year, seeking Mutua's win in the gubernatorial arrest to be revoked over electoral malpractices. The National Council of Churches of Kenya, well known as NCCK, will today speak on the state of the nation. Among the issues expected to be addressed include the ongoing crackdown on opposition leaders by government and the unpopular media shutdown that ended just yesterday. Of course, we begin with our top story this morning. The vetting of four cabinet nominees is set to start any minute from now at County Hall, right in the capital, Nairobi. Our senior parliamentary reporter, Patrick Amimo, will be following this story and will be joining me shortly. But for now, let's go through some of the profile of the cabinet nominees who are expected to be vetted today by the Parliament's Committee on Appointments. And we're going to have them on our video wall uh, shortly. And let me go through some of their 
profile, shall we? And uh, we begin with our first nominee, who is Keriako Tobiko. He's a nominee for Environment and Forestry Ministry. He is the immediate former director of public uh, prosecutions, well known as the DPP. The next nominee is Rashid Achesa Mohammed, who is the nominee for Sports and Heritage. He's a former ODM youth leader in Kakamega County. He is the youngest of all the nominees. And then next we have Simon Chelugui, who is the nominee for Water and Sanitation, a very key ministry as far as the four key agendas of Jubilee is concerned. He's a former director of Betting and Licensing Board. Uh, he lost Baringo senatorial arrest to Gideon Moy. The next nominee is a former governor, Ukuri Atani, is the nominee for Labor and Social Protection Ministry. Is the immediate former Marsabit governor, as I've already mentioned, and lost second bid for the gubernatorial seat in the same county, which is ranked, of course, as the biggest or the largest county in Kenya. Well, there you have it. Those are the four individuals who are expected to be vetted or grilled today by the Parliament's Committee on Appointments. Now, let's cross over to the County Hall. And nominees, of course, are set to be vetted any minute from now at County Hall, right in the capital. Our senior parliamentary reporter, Patrick Amimo, will be following this story and now joins me live from there. Amimo, good morning. And perhaps can you take us through the nominees who are expected today and perhaps if there are any affidavits uh, that have been filed against them? Thank you, Yusuf. In fact, this particular session is about to start. Already the chairperson of the committee is the speaker of the National Assembly is in the House, just waiting for the first nominee to appear, who is Tiko Kiriako, the former director of public prosecutions. He will be uh, being vetted in the position of uh, environment and forestry. Uh, there are, uh, Tobiko has an affidavit so against him with regard to his performance uh, during his tenure as the DPP. There are those people who feel that he did not deliver on some of those uh, issues to the prosecution and we'll be waiting to see who saw that affidavit before the committee. So uh, Tobiko will have to clear, uh, to clear himself with regard to those uh, issues that uh, this particular petitioner feels uh, make him not suitable for this particular uh, docket that has been, uh, been given. Uh, f uh, f after, after Tobiko will have... Uh, 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 we have uh, the former, uh, the person who contested in, uh, in Baringo as, as senator, yeah, that is Simon Chelugui, who will also appear before this vetting committee. After, and that uh, Chelugui is also facing integrity issues. And we'll also have to know oh, who the petitioner is and why he feels that Chelugui should not be uh, appointed uh, the CS Water and Sanitation. After Chelugui, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, Rashid, uh, Rashid uh, Echesa, who is a uh, nominee for CS. Uh, uh, CS Port Heritage. They are also touching on uh, on Rashida to do with his academic qualifications. There are those who feel that uh, they need to know to do to answer with regard to his uh, academic uh, acad uh, his schooling and 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 the papers that he holds. Uh, it's something that we'll, we'll be keen to see how how it goes about. There are also those who feel that um, you know uh, w while serving as a former ODM youth leader in uh, in 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 uh, uh, in uh, he had he was involved in some issues in Western Kenya. There are people who claim that uh, he might have been. Um, he might have been uh, invo uh, involved in uh, maybe um, assisting uh, or assisting in, in violence activities in that particular region. So he loved to clear uh, those allegations that are facing him, whether they are true, true whether it's true or not. And also, lastly, Okoria Tan will be the last person we see here uh, for the position of. Uh, we will be the last bit here and is the former Marsabit, uh, Marsabit County Governor and we know Ukuri Atani also had when, when his name was uh, first, uh, first uh, uh, unveiled by President Uhuru Kenyatta we saw leaders from Marsabit County including the, the current Governor Mohammed, Mohammed and elected leaders in the, in the county come out against uh, Ukuri Atani's uh, nomina nomination for that particular slot they said yes we want the CS uh, from Marsabit but it should Ukuri uh, and, and, and I think this is a fallout from the for, from the election that uh, we held last year, Aga. So we'll be seeing whether uh, Ukuri Atan also has someone who is uh, maybe who is in, uh, in the petition against uh, his his candidature. So that is the position today. Four candidates will be appearing before the committee on appointments. Yesterday we saw 
of individuals appear before the committee. Out of the five that appeared yesterday, it's only uh, it's only uh, former Meru Meru Governor Peter Munya who had integrity issues touching on. Um, on this refusal to appear before the Senate Committee on County, Public Accounts and Investments uh, with regard to uh, some of those issues and how he used the funds of the county and also uh, something touching on how he used his private vehicle to fuel, uh, I mean, to, to, to repair using county funds. But Munya defended himself before the committee and said uh, those allegations are uh, there. He is a clean person and he doesn't, he's not aware whether there's any case that is coming before him.